Good morning. Good morning. MCC of the Coachella Valley. God bless you this morning. There are people here who I've known for more than 40 years. You're looking great. Some I know from the old days of Founders MCC now, MCCLA, from uh, many places, colleagues like Reverend David Farrell and, and others. I dare not mention everybody. I will leave someone out. And uh, But just what a joy it is. Just like in Florida, eventually it seems like everyone ends up there. People end up in Palm Springs. <laughs> great and wonderful. What a joyous time of worship. I'm so thrilled to be here with you today. Uh, I'm thrilled for your faithfulness to MCC and the vision of this church. And I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart, from our Council of Elders, from our leadership, our governing board, and so many brothers and sisters in more than 40 countries around the world who say thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for being the hands and feet and voice of MCC here in the Coachella Valley. Thank you for hanging in there through tough times and in wonderful times. <clears throat> you have already made a difference, and I just also want to say <clears throat> how much I love your pastor. I know he's been transformational also in this place, and I think he's just wonderful and amazing. Will you give him a big hand? next week in visiting churches from Northern California, uh, a seminary there, and so uh, I'm so grateful for that and for uh, coming along with me on that trip. I want to thank Reverend Onetta for uh, driving me this morning. We, uh, we had quite a time. I don't know about some of you if you came the way we did, but there were at least two freeways totally blocked, and so we were, it had interesting challenges and then got here early, so God is <laughs> moderator of MCC today, where we are working with LGBT Christians in Russia, with communities in the Ukraine and Estonia. This May, for the very first time, Reverend Elder Mona West will be in Estonia with a large gathering of LGBT Christians and our first Reven, Readiness to Enter Vocational Ministry. It's that clergy retreat when people are ready to transfer to become MCC clergy. We hope to have seven or eight, maybe even nine clergy from Russia, Ukraine, Estonia, possibly Poland, other places. Uh, and we have congregations in many of those places that are ready to begin a process of, of coming to MCC. So I ask for your prayers for this amazing uh, journey we've been on for a long time in Eastern Europe and for the progress being made. Please pray for one of our newest congregations, Pastor Daniel in Seoul, South Korea. Very exciting uh, group of Christians meeting there and being very out for the very first time in Korea with their community. And pray for them as they bring change to their own community. And in places like El Salvador and Cuba and places around the world where people are hungry for good news, Amen. God's love, God's <coughs> inclusive love. We recently, uh, as of actually April 1st, will be hiring our first full-time global church, New Church Starts director, working on New Church Starts in the United States and in Canada and around the world. And so please pray for that effort as we also um, begin to work in Hispanic North America to create ministries that really welcome all people in our churches. I want to say to you today that I feel more optimistic and excited and on fire about the message and ministry of MCC, which I know is needed more than ever. I hear that every single day. I see it in my travels. And I know you know it in your own community. Will you pray with me? God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. I like to think when I'm visiting an MCC church and I'm not installing a pastor or doing an anniversary that I'm really just the pastor du jour. So I'd like to be your pastor du jour this morning and have that privilege. I love this story of blind bartender.
Bartimaeus. Why Bartimaeus, a child, a son of Abraham in his own community, but really not acknowledged as that by his community. I love the story that uh, as Clinton read the gospel reading by Eugene Peterson, I love the message because uh, Eugene Peterson was a pastor and writes and translates these Bible stories as a pastor. And so I always appreciate the freshness, the colloquialisms that kind of shock us a little bit when we hear such as, it's your lucky day. <laughs> <laughs> and this story occurs in the gospel right before Palm Sunday. So we're a couple of weeks early to have it read and preached on this morning. but. I love it as a culmination story. It's really a summary of everything that's happened up till now in the gospel story as they get ready to move in the story of Holy Week. It has joy and hope, it has miracles and healing that all come from an encounter with Jesus that is transformative. This story is meant to be a story about all of us as followers, as disciples, and we are to see ourselves in this encounter through Bartimaeus. They are in Jericho, kind of a famous place in the Bible. And I love that Eugene Peterson says, and Jesus is trailed by his disciples and a parade of people. The disciples are trailing, which kind of means they're not keeping up with Jesus. This is a point in the story. Jesus is going somewhere. He has a sense of vision and energy but the disciples don't really know where he's going. They don't know where he's going spiritually sometimes. They don't know where he's going in terms of the justice and the things that he cares about. But they're kind of trailing behind, trying to keep up. And then there's the parade of people who are kind of the looky loops. You know, they're, they're kind of going along for the ride and parade, but they're, they're not quite sure what's happening, but it looks like a fun party, so they're going along for the experience. And in the middle of this, it says Jesus stopped. You know, I think of that, there's so many occasions like that in the Gospels, aren't there? Where Jesus gets stopped by someone or something, a, a woman who tucks at the hem of his garment, right? You know, he says, who touched me? And the disciple says, what do you mean? Everybody's touching you, are you kidding me? No, who, who touched me? I felt power go out of me. Or Zacchaeus, up in the tree, in Jericho. Or the lepers, or so many others. As Jesus is going somewhere, he is interrupted. And Jesus' interruptions are his mission and his work. That's what we have to remember. It's the interruptions where the real action, where the real ministry occurs. If we're honest with ourselves, that's also true for ourselves and our lives. We think we know where we're going and what we're doing, but really, Sometimes God has something else in mind. Yeah. It is what happens when you're on your way, you're going somewhere, you're busy, but you get stopped. And things really begin to happen. And Bartimaeus cries out. That's what stopped Jesus. This little guy on the side of the road, a blind beggar, yeah. lowly, at the bottom of the social pile in his community. One of the most marginalized. Not only is he disabled, Line, but he is poor, and he is reduced to being a beggar, presumably with no place to live. And he cries, and he shouts out, have mercy on me. It's that song that says, Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. Yeah. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. That's where that song comes from, of the story. Don't pass me by, Jesus. Savior, Savior. Now what happens, of course, is the people are embarrassed. You know, he may be a son of Abraham, but he's an embarrassment. You know, there he is, crying out again. You know, so, and he's probably smelly, and he probably hasn't taken a bath in a very long time, and, and you know, he's shouting, he sounds crazy in some way, and so they're saying, hush, hush. Jesus has more important things to do. He's on his way to somewhere, something really important. And this is the way in which we see how they don't get it, right? Why is it that the disciples and the people that follow Jesus never seem to understand that blind Bartimaeus is about to do something enormous for Jesus? 
he is about to remind Jesus of why, of who he is, what he came to do, and why he came to do it. Jesus has so many experiences of that, like the Syrophoenician woman, you know, who, you know, suddenly in so many ways Jesus gets reminded in the midst of perhaps being exhausted or in the midst of being on another errand for some reason. Jesus gets reminded of why I am really here, what I am really called to do. What Jesus was called to do was to go to the very bottom of powerlessness and suffering and lostness in the world and to focus on it and to bring healing and hope and joy. What better mission could you have? What better mission could MCC have? Go to the very bottom, the very edges, the very margins of powerlessness and suffering and loss. Focus on it and bring healing and hope. You know, sometimes we get caught up in things, don't we? Church can be a very busy place. I'm telling you, being moderator of MCC, I can get caught up in that we're running an organization, and organizations have their own life and needs and things like that. Sometimes it makes us forget why we're really doing what we're doing. We're not doing it for ourselves. We're doing for those who still need us, who may not even yet know that there is a God who loves them and wants to heal them. Rich or poor or anything in between, lovely or unlovely, sighted or blind. In every encounter, Jesus transformed others and he himself was transformed. And so hearing blind Bartimaeus shout out twice, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He stops and says, call him. At that point, the crowds get very, very excited. And they say, get up, get up, get up, you know. Get up, Bartimaeus, go. It's your lucky day. <laughs> Jesus, take heart. Jesus is calling you. I think about this luck idea. That, uh, not, I don't know what Eugene Peterson was thinking exactly, but I, I'm trying to imagine that. And I remember being in a seminary. I was at a Roman Catholic seminary many years ago. And they were teaching about the sacraments and about where Sabbath came from. That very first idea of a holy day, one day a week. And the teacher I had was talking about that in the ancient Near East, prior to the Jews, prior to Abraham being called, as we heard today, that people in the ancient Near East thought that every seventh day was an unlucky day. And during that day, you wouldn't leave your house because something bad might happen to you. And you wouldn't go to work. And you wouldn't do many other things because you were full of fear of what would happen. And he talked about how the Jews transformed that idea and linked it to the creator of heavens and earth and said the Sabbath is a good day. It's not an unlucky day. It's a day of rest. It's a day of joy. It's a day to connect to your family and your God and yourself, to read the scriptures, to, be <coughs> to, to eat and drink and be with your family. I think about that, about this transformation in this moment. Bartimaeus, this is your lucky day. In a sense, this is your holy Sabbath. It's your, it's your moment. It's your 15 minutes of fame, Bartimaeus. <laughs> you know? And the point of the story is that we are Bartimaeus. All of us have challenges, whether they're visible or not visible. All of us have blind spots. And God offers all of us a moment, a lucky day. And that day, friends, is today. Yeah. This is the day that God has made. Yeah. Let us rejoice and make that day. I have friends who say we're not here by accident, but by appointment. Yeah. By divine appointment. Today, this is the day that God has made. Years ago, at MCC Los Angeles, when I was pastor, there was a young man, and I'm going to tell his story because he's told it publicly many times. His name is Griff. And Griff came to MCC when he was 15 years old, a very vulnerable, young, gay boy, not even a man. And uh, he came out, and that was wonderful, but he got into drugs, he got into drinking alcohol, and by the time he was in his early 30s, he was struggling and suffering with alcoholism, and finally one morning, hungover, one Sunday morning, he thought, well, I don't know what else to do, maybe I'll just, I'll go back to church. What Griff didn't know that day was that that was once a year, we had something called Recovery Sunday. Yes. 
And that was when people in our church who were seasoned in recovery, whether it was recovery from alcohol, drugs, or sex addiction, or whatever it was, would stand up in front of the congregation before they read the scripture, before they helped with communion, and they would tell their story very shortly, but about how it was that, that they uh, came to turn their lives over to a power greater than themselves, and how they had come to know that power in the person of Jesus Christ in, in this church and talked about the, the amazing power of recovery. And so Griff walked in not knowing, you might say even blindly that someday, as a Bartimaeus, and he walked in needing mercy, needing something, and he landed there on recovery Sunday and came up to the altar that day. I remember it, tears streaming down his face. He's sober today, living in Atlanta, Georgia. I talked to him not long ago, and I think about that day that was his lucky day. Yes. It was his lucky day. Yes. <laughs> there was a powerful synchronicity in that moment that can only come from God. Yes. <clears throat> and it's a mystery. I don't know why it happens. I don't know what doesn't, why it doesn't happen all the time. Maybe we're not paying attention. I have no idea. But I know what happened for Griff that day and for many others. When I was 11 or 12 years old, a very long time ago. We're talking about the early 60s. <laughs> and while I was coming, about, about uh, six years before MCC started, 11 or 12, I, uh, entering puberty, I knew in myself that I was different. I had no vocabulary or words. I didn't even really know it was about sexuality. I had no idea. I knew I was lonely. I knew I wasn't fitting in, like most teenagers anyway, but there was something more, something deeper, and I had in me a deep fear and a sense of uh, despair. Um, you know, if I lived with that a much longer time, I might have been a statistic and had never had the experience I've had in my life. I have no idea. But I was anxious and I was uh, worried, and I was sitting in my bedroom and there was a window, and there was a street light, and something happened. And that street light got very large, and I felt something come into my room. And then it had a voice, and it's the voice that I didn't hear audibly really, but I heard it in my spirit, and it was not my voice. And it said, I know you feel like you don't have any friends but I want you to know I'm your friend. Yeah. Yeah. I'm your friend. Yeah. And for right now, the voice said, I am enough. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then there was a little addendum, and it said, and someday, you'll have other friends. Yeah. I promise you. I sat there in that room, and something fundamental changed in me. Later on, I would also identify it with a calling. But at that moment, I had a friend, capital F. And I came to know that friend. And you know, 10 years later, I walked into Metropolitan Community Church in Boston, Massachusetts, in their third Sunday. And there I knew I met the friends that God had promised me. Friends I've had for 42 years. <laughs> what a lucky day. <laughs> and I've had a lot of lucky days since then. Over and over and over again. In a, in a partner of 36 years. In friends for a lifetime. Amazing. It was my lucky day. And you know what was interesting about that lucky day? Was that nothing actually changed in my life. You know, I still didn't have a lot of friends in school. I was awkward as an adolescent, and it was tough. But you know what? Everything had changed. And I had a place to stand and to be and to trust that uh, that was just temporary. <laughs> that my loneliness or discouragement was not going to last because God had promised me friends that would come. And most of all, I had a friend. Yeah. He was always my friend. You know, I love the story about as Bartimaeus says what he wants and needs. As he
He said, I want to see. And Jesus just says to him, on your way. <laughs> your faith has made you whole. Interestingly, it says Bartimaeus didn't go on his way. He actually followed Jesus then. In this well, sometimes Jesus tells people, don't, don't follow me. Go back to your home and tell people all about it. But in this case, Bartimaeus becomes part of the parade now. <clears throat> part of that community. How powerful and amazing. I think about that. How God can do miracles. There are mysteries. So many things. A couple of years ago, I met a young woman named Renee, a young transgender woman, probably about 20. In her second year of college, um, all I knew was she'd been from NCC New York and she was on her way to the Dominican Republic with our young adult youth group who were going to work in an orphanage, people whose parents had died from AIDS and other things. And so I was sitting and talking with her, Renee, and I said, Renee, why are you going on this trip, you know? Taking 10 days of her time out of her summer. And she said, when I was six years old, my mother died from drug addiction and HIV. And I was, went into the foster care system in Oklahoma, where I was abused, where I experienced terrible things. And she said, when I was able to, I ran away to New York City, where I went from the, you know, you know, into the fiery furnace of hell, really. I was on the streets. Um, she said, I prostituted myself for drugs. And then one day, she said, one day, one day, I walked into Sylvia's place at MCC New York. Yes. Yes. At the only queer youth shelter in Manhattan. And she said, uh, it changed everything for me. And I, I finished high school. I'm in my second year of college. <coughs> and she said, I'm going on this trip because she said, I'm so lucky, <coughs> and I want to pay it forward, yes. and I want to tell these kids that they too could have hope. And I thought, if I had been orphaned when I was six, and abused, and drug addicted, and trafficked, and I'd been, and I'd finally found a place, would I say I'm lucky? I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure <coughs> that I could say that. But I knew what she meant. And it wasn't luck at all, was it really? It's grace. Yes. Because yes. this is really what <coughs> Eugene Peterson was telling us. Your lucky day, because people thought it was luck, but it wasn't luck. No. It's grace. It was grace that Renee experienced. And how amazing that she could take that in, that she could pull her life with God's help, that she could have somebody believe in her, in that church. And that she could finish high school and go to college. Oh my gosh. Yes. You know, oh my gosh. You think about that. This is our day of grace. MCC around the world today. In places like Uganda, where we're reaching out to people who are really going through tough times, helping them find spa safe space. <coughs> in places we are like Nigeria, where we're helping people find shelter in a very hostile place. I was on Al Jazeera TV uh, a few weeks ago. <clears throat> I played uh, a show called The Stream. I was on with Jay Baker and with two very homophobic fundamentalists on this TV show. I hadn't done that in a while, Dave Farrell. I, oh, I loved it. It was just on right back in my helmet. And there we were on TV that this show goes into 280 million homes around the world, not in the U.S., it's locked in the U.S. But what was so amazing in that moment was afterwards we began to get people contacting us, including a young man from Nigeria who Skyped me. And I Skyped back and forth with him, and he's, you know, like in his early 20s. He's a Christian in Nigeria, and he's going to his church, and you know the new sentence in Nigeria, they're you're even thought to be gay, is 14 years in prison. And he said, I was in my church, and someone looked at me and said, 14 years is a long time. And suddenly he said, I had a chill through my body. I know they know. And I know I'm not safe in my own church, in my own community. And so we began talking about how we could help him become safe, either staying in his own country or looking for a skill. I'm so proud of the MCC churches, like MCC Toronto, who is right now part of a campaign. They're working with 450 asylum people who have asylum. They have a ministry, they have a half-time staff person, and a weekly support group, and they work every year with getting people who need asylum to get asylum to be safe. But I also think
think of our churches like Corpus Christi, Texas. You know, we have a little church in Corpus Christi, Texas. And in that church, um, they have a food pantry. And they are the third largest food pantry in Corpus Christi. And they serve a third of the people of Corpus Christi who need food, almost all of whom speak Spanish in their neighborhood. And they do this every day in Corpus Christi. About 30, 35 people in that church. It has become their passion and their ministry. And I think about how proud I am of places and small churches and people doing things like you are doing in this community. I think of our pastor, Reverend Dan Cochell in San Diego, who is going to be the Grand Marshal in the Tijuana Pride Parade. <laughs> <laughs> and he's doing that. The church is the Grand Marshal, I think, for the whole for the San Diego Parade. <clears throat> but Dan has been doing same-sex unions in Spanish in Tijuana for years reaching out, offering pastoral care and love and support from MCC. And so this year they're honoring him and the work of MCC San Diego in the Tijuana Pride Parade. Powerful. I think about folks contemplating a new MCC in Salt Lake City. I'll be speaking this week at the University of Utah and meeting with a group of people who want and need MCC in Salt Lake City. We had a church there years ago. It folded and here we are having that opportunity People are hungry. And you know, somebody in Salt Lake City doesn't know it, but it's going to be their lucky day. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't expect you here. Amen. Whether yeah. they come to that lecture or they come to the Pride Center and they, they meet with me and they talk about MCC, it's going to be somebody's lucky day. Yeah. I know that yes. in my spirit. I know that's why we're going there. And I say, if not today, then when? Because today is the day of salvation. Now is the moment that Jesus is calling you and me to rise up and live our calling. So I'm going to offer something today. Maybe you don't usually do, but I'm going to do it because I'm the pastor du jour, right? <laughs> and so I'm going to offer to you to say, maybe this is your lucky day. Maybe this is your lucky day. And maybe there's something that uh, you've stopped praying for. You're so discouraged. You just stopped praying. Have you ever had anything like that? Yeah. You just stopped praying. Yeah. Or maybe you've been fighting a calling in your life. You've been resisting. You've been saying, oh, Jesus, pass me by in another way. You know, don't call me. Some people do get to the point where they say, God, you know, don't call me, I'll call you. <laughs> but, you know, God doesn't let it get us get away. Maybe there's just something in your life that you didn't anticipate today when you came here, that maybe it is God wants to do something. Maybe it's healing. Maybe it's hope. Maybe it's calling. Maybe it's a ministry. Maybe you feel just unwanted, unloved, and alone, and uh, it's time to give that up. And to trust that the friend that you have will bring you other friends. I can testify on that. <laughs> so I invite you now. We had a little music that would be nice. Just something we played before. <laughs> just, just one of those songs you sang before church so beautifully. Just so okay. and If you feel like we just want prayer, just we'll pray together as a group. I invite you to come up. If it's your lucky day today. <laughs> if it's a day of grace.
<laughs> Isn't that a great thing? You never acknowledge or understand. God, I want to pray right now for these amazing brothers and sisters. God, you know right now what's on their heart. You know what they need. Let them hear you say, Jesus, what can I do for you? Let them hear you say, go on your way. Live your life. Be healed. God, whatever it is, freedom from fear, freedom from pain or loneliness or heartbreak, whether it's breaking down the walls of resistance to a calling, God, whatever it is, God, I mean, right now we feel, we hear the tears, we hear that place. We hear us, we are Bartimaeus. We saw you walking by and we didn't want you to get all the way past us. And we're calling out to you, have mercy on me. And unbelievably, Jesus, you stop. And somebody says, it's your What can I do for you? What can I do for you? God, it's all here at your altar. This altar, it's the descendant of the altar that Trimary started with in a coffee table in his living room. And it's the grace and mercy of Christ available to us right now. We touch the hem of your garment right here. We reach out, we grab it. We dance for joy, like Bartimaeus, no longer blind, <laughs> free, singing, able. God, you're going to do great things. Somebody's going to tell the story of this lucky day one day. They're going to tell it in a sermon. <laughs> They're going to tell it in a testimony. They're going to say, this was the day I remember. I remember that you blessed me and touched me, that you made it new, that you made it right that you made it whole, that you made it possible. God, you are our way maker. You are our joy. We bless you. We thank you for this church, for this community, for every individual, for every heart in this place. Bless us. Use us. Thank you. And all the people say, Amen. Amen. So give each other a hug. <laughs>